I, 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 I was saying that uh, I'll start with a couple of general comments on the topic, and then we can throw it open to discussion. Uh, it, it, it's uh, quite uh, usual these days to draw analogies between South Africa and, uh, and Israel. Uh, most of them, I think, are questionable at best. But there's one that isn't discussed much, if at all, that is actually quite valid, I think, one analogy. Now, that has to do with the topic, with the matter of what's nowadays called uh, legitimation and uh, delegitimation. Uh, that was an issue for South Africa for about the last uh, 40 years of the white nationalist regime. Uh, back in 1958, the South African foreign minister called in the U.S. ambassador uh, to talk to him and said, uh, we know that we're becoming a kind of an international pariah. Uh, everyone's voting against us in the United Nations. Uh, we're right, but they don't understand it. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because you and I both understand that there's only one vote at the United Nations, namely yours. Uh, and as long as you, the United States, uh, back us up, uh, we don't really care what the world thinks. And, and uh, so matters, in fact, proceeded. Uh, through the, uh, by the 1970s, uh, the United Nations had, uh, did declare an arms embargo on uh, South Africa. Uh, South Africa, by that point, was reacted by becoming extremely aggressive and contemptuous towards the international community, and in fact, uh, even the United States, uh, President Carter at that time. Uh, so for example, when President Carter and uh, <clears throat> a group of international diplomats <coughs> uh, were about to present a plan uh, to, for a, a South African withdrawal from Namibia, a UN protectorate which they were uh, occupying, sending in uh, a population and so on, in violation of uh, uh, UN orders. Uh, just at that point, South Africa uh, uh, attacked a, uh, a refugee camp in Angola, Kasinga refugee camp, killing 800 people, causing international outcry, uh, but they basically didn't care. Well, fortunately for them, Ronald Reagan came along, and uh, he strongly supported the apartheid regime uh, and continued to support it right through the 1980s. Uh, that included its uh, aggression and violence in neighboring countries, which was quite lethal, killing over a million people. Uh, plus what was going on within South Africa. Uh, but the, but the U.S. supported it. In fact, U.S. trade with South Africa increased. Uh, that was in violation even of congressional sanctions by that time. And the uh, justification for it was the war on terror. Uh, the war on terror was not declared by George W. Bush, contrary to what's claimed. He redeclared it. It was declared by Ronald Reagan when he came into office in 1981. Uh, announcing that uh, 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 international terrorism, plague of the modern age, uh, would be the focus of uh, U.S. foreign policy. So in the case of South Africa, the justification was you had to defend the white nationalist regime against the, the terrorism of the African National Congress. Uh, in fact, in 1988, uh, the U.S. Uh, designated, this is Mandela's ANC, uh, he was of course in prison, uh, designated it, the U.S. designated the uh, ANC as one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. In fact, Mandela was just taken off the terrorist list about two years ago. He can now come to the United States without a special dispensation. Uh, the, uh, uh, then uh, the U.S. policy changed. Around 1989, 1990, the U.S. policy shifted, uh, and within two or three years, uh, the white nationalist regime had collapsed, and apartheid was over. Now, this is not the only time that's happened. 
Incidentally, that was not the only factor. Uh, another major factor was uh, Cuba. Uh, Cuba, which has a, had played an enormous role in the liberation of uh, black Africa, it's sort of well known by now to scholarship, but not to the general public. Uh, they essentially drove South Africans out of Namibia, uh, and uh, as they had driven them out of Angola, and that was a big factor. But uh, the main change was just that the U U.S. policy shifted, and exactly as the South African uh, uh, foreign minister had uh, said 40 years earlier, when the U.S. changed policy, uh, the regime collapsed. As I say, there are other cases. Uh, well, the problem for South Africa was its delegitimation in the international community, sustained by U.S. support, so it didn't matter until the U.S. support was withdrawn, and the legitimation of its main enemy, the African National Congress, which by the late 80s was, uh, had an enormous international support. Uh, Mandel was uh, kind of a secular saint by now. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, that's, those of you who follow Israeli affairs know that that's pretty much what they're discussing now with great concern. This concern that the country is being uh, delegitimated uh, in the international arena. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it's uh, uh, the, Palestinian, the Palestinians uh, uh, are being legitimated. Uh, that's a situation, and, and they have one supporter, the United States, alone. In fact, that has gone on for a long time. Uh, you probably know that a couple of months ago in February, there was a Security Council resolution calling on uh, uh, Israel to uh, pursue what in fact is official U.S. policy, namely to stop settlement expansion. It was vetoed by the United States alone. Uh, that aroused some attention, but it really shouldn't have because the U.S. had been vetoing some, uh, resolutions uh, uh, condemning Israel's actions for a long time. The first one was in January 1976, 35 years ago, when uh, the major Arab states brought to the Security Council a resolution calling for a, a two-state settlement, uh, uh, Israel and a Palestinian state, uh, on the international border, so-called Green Line, uh, with, and then it uh, took up the wording of uh, UN 242, which everyone recognizes to be the main, the main diplomatic uh, 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 instrument. Uh, so there would have to be it added uh, the guarantees for the uh, security uh, of every state in the region and its uh, right to exist within secure and recognized borders. Uh, that's, that's 1976, uh, the U.S. vetoed again in 1980. Uh, we'll run through the rest of the record. Uh, but until the present, that's been the pattern. Uh, things moved out of the Security Council because I was excluded by the U.S. veto. Uh, but the General Assembly, almost every year, it was, had regular votes, uh, you know, 150 to 2 or something like that. And uh, that continues up to the present. Well, this is uh, continuing. There'll be another important vote very likely in the coming session of the General Assembly next, uh, starting next September as a winter meeting. Uh, what's coming up then is, Palest is recognition of Palestinian statehood. The, uh, 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 by now, uh, well over 100 countries uh, recognize Palestine. Uh, that's about uh, something like 80 to 90 percent of the world's population. <coughs> In contrast, uh, uh, Kosovo, which is now accepted as in the United Nations, is supported by a tiny fraction of that. But the crucial difference is the U.S. does not join the 80 to 90 percent recognizing Palestine, and the U.S. does recognize Kosovo. So that's basically the South African the minister's uh, insight into how world affairs works, and he's correct. Uh, but anyway, this is going to come up, it's very likely going to come up in September. 
and it'll pose uh, another dilemma for the United States. Uh, will it stand virtually alone uh, in the uh, international system in blocking the kind of settlement uh, for which there is simply an overwhelming international consensus? Hard to find anything like this in world affairs. But for years, uh, there's been an overwhelming agreement on approximately the January 1976 uh, Security Council proposal that the U.S. vetoed. Uh, by now, it includes essentially everybody, at least formally. Uh, all the non-aligned countries, uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, <coughs> uh, the Arab League, which has an even more forthcoming proposal, uh, the uh, Organization of Islamic States, which includes Iran, uh, in fact, essentially everyone. Uh, the only holdouts are the United States and Israel, and the South African minister's principle still applies. Uh, there's only one vote, uh, that's the United States. Uh, the consequence of having overwhelming power. Uh, so the world can say what it wants, but if the United States objects, nobody can do anything about it. Well, that's the, um, and that of course shapes uh, commentary and uh, uh, discussion and so on, at least in the United States, to some extent elsewhere, lesser extent. Uh, well, that's basically the situation, and it's, and it's uh, as far as Israel's uh, delegitimation is concerned, uh, they're getting much more concerned. So, for example, Human Rights Watch, which is a very conservative organization, they don't take strong positions on policy, uh, they recently came out with a uh, declaration <coughs> which I don't think was even reported here, at least I didn't see it, uh, which uh, called on the United States to terminate uh, aid to Israel, any aid to Israel, uh, up to the level of what Israel spends uh, in the occupied territories. Because as they point out correctly, all of that is in violation of international law. Uh, they also call on the United States government to uh, investigate uh, uh, foundations, organizations, uh, others in the United States, which have a tax-free status and are uh, 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 giving aid to anything in Israel that involves uh, discrimination and repression. So that would include everything in the occupied territories plus more. That cuts quite a wide, a wide uh, swath if you look at it. Uh, they also called upon Europe, and of course the United States as well, to boycott uh, goods from the settlements and to refuse in any way to participate in uh, uh, activities in uh, supporting Israeli activities in the occupied territories, uh, all of which are illegal. I mean, that's not been in question for years. It was uh, actually was recognized by the government of Israel back in 1967. Uh, any transfer of population into the occupied territories is in violation of the Geneva Convention's core of uh, uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, as I say, that was recognized by Israel's top legal authorities back in 1967, including the Attorney General, including uh, the official in charge of the occupied territories, General Moshe Dayan, who simply pointed out, sure, it's illegal that states violate international law. And so we will too. And they can as long as the big boys in Washington uh, support them, basically the South African principle. And so it continues to the present. Most recently, the February 2011 Security Council resolution uh, uh, called that, uh, uh, of which the core was supporting official U.S. policy. That is calling for an end to settlement expansion. But the U.S. vetoed it uh, in accord with the traditional uh, pattern. We'll see what happens this September, but it could be quite significant. Uh, Amnesty International, also, which also very rarely takes strong positions on policy issues, uh, had already uh, called for a, an arms embargo on Israel uh, directed to the United States because it's, uh, this is the time of the Gaza invasion, because Israel was using uh, the arms in violation of international law. They could have, but didn't add 
that the arms that the United States is sending to Israel are also uh, used in violation of U.S. domestic law, which uh, conditions arms transfers on uh, very, very specifically on particular uses only, the defense and uh, uh, internal security, and of course anything. The Gaza war was obviously not that, and nor, is, nor any of Israel's actions in, in the occupied territories. Well, Israel's reacting to all of this in pretty much the way South Africa did. Uh, a lot of hysteria, a lot of anger circling the wagons, and carrying out actions, uh, very brutal and arrogant actions, which are almost, it's almost as if they're being carried out in purposeful defiance and contempt of international opinion, uh, like the uh, Gaza attack, or the attack on the uh, uh, flotilla last May, in which uh, uh, Israeli commandos uh, uh, landed on a ship uh, in international waters uh, uh, that was trying to bring humanitarian aid to Gaza and uh, killed nine people, including an American citizen. Which both of those actions caused an international furor. Uh, but again, uh, the one vote that matters uh, didn't go along with international opinion, so they think they can get away with it. And in fact, they're kind of, if you read the Israeli press, they're quite surprised that there is any international reaction because they're so obviously right in everything they do, just like South Africa. Uh, since they're obviously right, it must be that the world is, the world is therefore wrong, and there has to be some explanation, you know, anti-Semitism or whatever it might be. And the internal reactions in Israel are kind of like South Africa too, imposing uh, pretty harsh uh, legislation, uh, uh, some of it so pretty extreme, so much so that the head of the Israeli Bar Association, Shlomo Cohen, a pretty conservative figure, uh, recently had an article uh, uh, lamenting uh, what he called Israel's drift to fascism. It's a pretty strong word. And he ran through the legislation that uh, brought that, uh, that led him to that conclusion. Well, these are, uh, it's, it's not unfamiliar. In many respects, it is reliving the, the pattern of uh, uh, South Africa, particularly the reaction to the delegitimation that they perceived in the uh, sanctions movement, the boycotts, uh, uh, other protests, and uh, correspondingly the legitimation of their enemy, uh, which will come to a head uh, uh, just in, a, in, a, in just a few months in the case of uh, Israel-Palestine, uh, which will be a sensitive and interesting moment. Uh, well, what are the uh, options given these circumstances? Uh, one option is that the U.S. And, and will shift policy, as it did in the case of South Africa, and decide to join the world. Uh, that is to join into the long-standing and quite overwhelming international consensus and accept uh, the two-state settlement. Now, the general form of that settlement is pretty well known, and you can argue about details, but uh, there are, the basic guidelines are quite clear. And in fact, uh, it actually came quite close to realization once. Uh, there happens to have been one month in the last 35 years when a U.S. president was willing to tolerate a settlement uh, in terms of the international consensus. That was uh, Bill Clinton's last month in office. January 2001, uh, Clinton, there had been negotiations uh, in the summer before uh, at Camp David, and they broke down. And Clinton recognized that the position that the U.S. and Israel had proposed there could not be accepted by any Palestinians, no matter how moderate. So in December two th uh, t of 2000, uh, Clinton uh, proposed uh, what he called his parameters, the general guidelines for settlement, which were somewhat vague, but more forthcoming. He then made a speech in which he said that uh, both sides had accepted the parameters, uh, 
both sides had reservations. Uh, the two sides, Israel-Palestine, met in Taba, Egypt, in January 2001. We have no very detailed record of that uh, of those negotiations. There was international observers, uh, uh, detailed Israeli sources, and so on. And uh, they came pretty close to a settlement, uh, close enough so that uh, in their last press conference, uh, the jointly the group said that if they had a little more time, they could have uh, settled everything, all the details. Uh, well, Israel called off the negotiations prematurely, and it didn't continue. Now, there were informal, high-level negotiations that did continue, came out with proposals, and one, the best known one, was called the uh, Geneva. The chorus was presented in Geneva in December 2003 by the two sides. It was welcomed by the world. Uh, Europeans sent envoys and so on. Uh, Israel rejected it. The U.S. didn't even refuse even to comment on it, barely mentioned here in the press. Uh, but it w that was an extremely detailed proposal. Uh, you can think it was right or wrong. Uh, you can argue about it. But the facts are it was very close to the international consensus that has been accepted for a long time. And it happens to be exactly in accord with international law. It's been reiterated over and over, most recently even authoritatively by the uh, International Court of Justice with the U.S. Justice agreeing in a separate declaration uh, a couple of years ago, 2004. <clears throat> well, that's one option. One possibility is that the U.S. will make the same kind of move that it finally made in the case of South Africa and uh, then would come the task of implementing it, but it's really not a big problem. Once the U.S. agrees, uh, it can be done. Uh, that's one option. Now, most of the discussion of this topic assumes that there's a choice between two options. One, the one I just described, and another, that Israel takes over the whole territory, and then the Palestinians carry out a civil rights struggle internal to the now unified uh, 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 Israel-Palestine uh, on the an anti-apartheid struggle. So that's, uh, that's considered the other option. You look at most of the debate about the topic, that's what it is. Uh, Israel, uh, in, in Israel, it's uh, objected that this would uh, create what they call a demographic problem, meaning too many non-Jews in a Jewish state, so that'll be a problem. But uh, and the, the many Palestinians are supporting it. They say this is the way to go. The two-state settlement is out, so we'll have a one-state settlement in which we'll have an anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, uh, there's only one problem with this. It's om this discussion, it's omitting the third option, the realistic option. Uh, Israel will never agree to this, nor is there any reason to expect them to. Uh, what they'll do is the third option namely continue doing exactly what they're doing. And if they have U.S. support, they can continue to do it. And we know what that is because it's happening under our eyes. It's been going on for years. Uh, since uh, the early 90s, the U.S. and Israel, and just about everything Israel does should be called U.S.-Israel because they work in tandem. And Israel cannot go beyond what the U.S. will support it will support and permit it to do. Uh, so there's uh, uh, the U.S. and Israel since the early 90s have been committed to separating Gaza from the West Bank in strict violation of the Oslo agreements, which declare them to be a territorial unity. It's been done in many ways, closures and so on and so forth. Uh, by now they're pretty separate. Uh, so if a uh, uh, person in uh, Gaza, say a young person in Gaza wants to study in West Bank University, can't do it. If uh, somebody in Gaza needs medical attention that they can get in a Jerusalem hospital, uh, can't go. Uh, if somebody wants to see their family, you know, not very many miles away, they can't do it. Uh, so by now they're pretty well split. That's one element. Uh, the second, with regard to the West Bank, is to take over Israel, the U.S. and Israel want to take over essentially what's valuable in the West Bank, 
and to let the rest uh, kind of rot. Uh, and we know exactly what it is because you can see it happening. And in fact, it's the plans are developed, have been developing step by step over the past 20 years. And sometimes it's called the Sharon plan, uh, sometimes something else, but it's always essentially the same. Uh, Israel takes over uh, everything that's inside what's called the separation wall. It's actually an annexation wall. It's a wall which snakes through the West Bank, uh, leaves on the Israeli side, uh, arable land, uh, major water resources, uh, uh, the pleasant suburbs of uh, the major cities like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, uh, takes over the Jordan Valley, which essentially imprisons the rest, and then cuts uh, corridors through the remaining area, uh, one east of Jerusalem, and I should say Jerusalem is now about five times what it, the size of what it was in 1967, annexed illegally in violation of Security Council orders. Uh, so it's a huge greater Jerusalem than corridor extending to, uh, to the east, which pretty much bisects the West Bank. That's what it was built for. Uh, and uh, two other corridors in the north, which you know, separate the rest. And uh, what's left uh, amounts to roughly 50% of the West Bank, and 42% at the moment probably will expand. Uh, the rest, uh, in, if Israel just takes that over, there's no demographic problem, because that region is kept free of Arabs, virtually. I mean, there's a couple of scattered. Arab settlements, but essentially free of Arabs. So no demographic problem. Uh, Israel gets the valuable territory, the valuable land, whatever it likes. And the Palestinians are left in uh, unviable uh, cantons, pretty much separated from one another. That's the option. That's the alternative to uh, having a two-state settlement. Now, notice I say settlement, not solution. I don't think a two-state settlement is, is or should be the end of the road. Uh, there, it could lay the basis for what seem to me better settlements, but you have to get there in stages. You can't just, uh, you know, say I want the world to be the way I, it, you know, I want the world to be the way I like it. And that doesn't work. You have to show how you get there, and uh, there, there are possible ways to get there, but I have heard nothing that. As any has uh, any option, uh, but this one. So those are the realistic options. Uh, well, uh, they depend crucially on uh, the U.S. position. Uh, will the U.S. join the world on this issue, or won't it? Uh, the uh, to say this goes far back. It goes back to the 1970s. Uh, there are many factors that keep the United States separate from world opinion, just as there were in the case of South Africa, many other issues. Uh, but we might as well face the reality. That's the structure of world order. Uh, the United States is an outlier. Uh, and uh, it's so powerful that it gets its way. Uh, but it gets its way in uh, a violation of uh, global opinion on many, many issues. Uh, that relates, I'll just say one word about this, to another major phenomenon that you're all familiar with, major events uh, that have been taking place in the past few months, the so-called Arab Spring, uh, the democracy uprisings in the Arab world. Now, these didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, the background is not discussed much, but it's pretty easy to find out. So take, say, Egypt, the most important country. Uh, you know, the biggest, most significant, and so on. Uh, the uh, uh, uprising, the Jan January 25th movement, uh, is uh, called the, it was led by a group of, uh, initiated by a group of fairly young, kind of tech-savvy uh, uh, professionals, pretty much, who called themselves uh, the April 6th movement. Well, why April 6th? Because on April 6th, 2008, there was a major labor action uh, organized by what has been quite a militant uh, labor movement at the Mahala Textile Conglomerate, one of the biggest industrial conglomerates in Egypt. They were going to have a labor action calling for you know, 
minimally decent uh, working conditions, uh, wages, and so on. And uh, along with it were to be solidarity actions in the, in the cities. Well, that was crushed by force, crushed by the US-backed dictator, uh, Mubarak. Uh, so therefore, we don't know about it, but they know about it. Uh, the victims tend to have memories. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, was reflected when the popular movement burst out again a few months ago, uh, led by the April 6th movement. The same is true in uh, Tunisia and the other places where things are happening. Uh, in any event, in the past couple of months, it's been quite spectacular. There have been major developments in the Arab world. There are moves towards... Uh, uh, at, there are efforts to try to construct some kind of, uh, to overthrow the uh, brutal repressive regimes and to bring about some sort of a degree of freedom and democracy. And if you look closely, you'll find that uh, the U.S. is pretty isolated on this to an extent along with Western Europe. There happens to be a very good reason why the United States and its allies cannot tolerate a democracy in the Arab countries. Very simple reason. Uh, you want to figure out why? Just take a look at the polls of Arab public opinion. Now, they don't get reported in the press here, but they're known, uh, and surely planners known. They're, the polls are taken by the most prestigious uh, U.S. polling organizations. They're released by major institutions, Brookings Institution, and so on. So they're perfectly public, and certainly in the eyes of planners are thinking about them. And what do you find when you look at them? Well, say take Egypt, again, the most important country. Uh, in Egypt, 90% uh, of the public thinks uh, the worst threat they face is the United States uh, and Israel, which they don't distinguish much from the United States, rightly. Uh, about 80% uh, think the region would be better off and more secure if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, a small percentage, roughly 10% in the region, think that Iran is a threat. Uh, these figures extend a you know, little variation over the, almost the entire region. Well, if you have anything like a functioning democracy, then public opinion is going to, reflect its, uh, it's going to be reflected in policy. That's what a democracy is supposed to be. So the idea that there could be a democratic uprising in the uh, Arab world is just a nightmare for Western planners. And they will do whatever they can to prevent it. And if you look closely, that's pretty much what's happening. Well, it's also a nightmare for Israel. Uh, Israel has relied on the uh, uh, Arab dictators to suppress their populations and to uh, enter into uh, arrangements with it. Uh, and if, there's, if public opinion uh, uh, manifests itself in policy, uh, that's, going to, uh, uh, that's going to be a huge problem, and they, they know it. That's why they're so strongly opposed to the, the democratic uprisings. And uh, the same is true here, though it's not put that way. Well, uh, that's going to have an effect, too. Uh, you know, so far, the uprisings have been fairly well controlled. They've changed the names, but not really the regimes. So say in Egypt, uh, the military still runs the show. Uh, but uh, that probably, you can't keep the lid on that forever. Uh, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, we don't read about it, but, it, but certainly planners know it. So again, go back about 50 years, and uh, President Eisenhower, late 50s, was uh, discussed in internal discussions it's all, it's been declassified for years, so it's public. Uh, he discussed with, uh, with his staff uh, what he called a campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world. And not from the governments, they're more or less okay, but from the people. Uh, and right at that time, the National Security Council, which is the main planning body, it came out with a memorandum discussing the Arab world, and they explained it. They said there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports harsh and brutal dictators and uh, prevents democracy and development. 
and that we do this because we want to make sure we can maintain control over um, their energy resources. And I went on to say that the perception is more or less accurate, and furthermore, that's pretty much what we should be doing. And so it continues right to the present. Uh, but again, uh, chances you can keep the lid on this forever are not very high. And so the explosion might get out of control, and that is certain to influence uh, other developments in the region in uh, quite unpredictable ways. Well, I'll stop with this. Uh, just uh, mention that you know, the crucial issue that we should bear in mind, I think, is that contrary to almost all uh, media and other commentary on this matter, uh, the framework uh, is not one in which, say, in Israel-Palestine, the United States is an honest broker uh, trying to bring about uh, negotiations between two recalcitrant, uh, difficult uh, parties, Israel and the Palestinians. That's simply not true. If there were serious negotiations going on, they would be run by some authentically neutral party, and the U.S. and Israel would be on one side, and the rest of the world would be on the other side. Uh, and that's the way they would have been going on for 35 years. Well, until we realize that, and until we do something about it, uh, this uh, region is going to continue to face uh, uh, extremely uh, dangerous times and very explosive ones, which uh, may blow up all over the world. I'll stop there. The Arab League is, at, is calling the UN for a no-fly zone over Gaza as a resolution. A no-fly zone? Over Gaza? Will Israel accept this resolution, or will it just continue what it's doing? It can't be a no-fly zone over Gaza because the ruler of the world doesn't permit it. Okay, just like uh, there's no uh, interference when the U.S. invades Iraq. I mean, look, that's the way the world works. It doesn't work the way you're taught in civics classes. Now, the world is ruled by force, not by law. And uh, force happens to be overwhelmingly in one place, not entirely, of course. And uh, so there can be, uh, uh, you know, if, if the U.S. is participating in an invasion, as it was in the case of Gaza, the Gaza invasion is a U.S.-Israeli invasion. That's why Amnesty International called for embargo. Uh, it's American arms they're using, American diplomatic support, and so on. So if the U.S. is participating in an act of aggression, uh, no, you can't have any interference. So sure they won't. It won't even get to the point where it could be considered. I mean, that doesn't have to happen. These things happen because the American population permits it. We're the only ones who can stop it. What percentage of uh, military spending, what percentage of military spending uh, throughout the world is spent here in the United States? Close to 50%, a little below 50%. Of course, that depends somewhat on how you count it. So if you count the spending for past wars, you know, for veterans, for interest on the debt, and so on, then it goes up even beyond that. But the standard calculations, uh, U.S. military spending is close to 50% of global spending. And of course, it's quite totally different in character. So this is far more advanced in uh, uh, technological uh, development and means of destruction. Uh, you could see that in Libya. I mean, the United States was kind of reluctant to get involved in Libya. Uh, France and Britain were in the forefront, but they couldn't even impose a no-fly zone without calling on the United States to do the heavy lifting. Uh, in the first couple of days, it was all U.S. tomahawks and uh, you know, warthogs and so on. Uh, the U.S. is so far in ahead of the rest of the world in military expenditures that it's laughable. Like the Pentagon comes out with statements warning about, say, the Chinese military buildup, you know, the next 
biggest power in the world. Well, it turns out, according to the Pentagon calculations, as by memory I may not have it exact, that uh, the Chinese military budget is roughly, I think they said, a fifth of what the United States spends in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is a fraction of the military budget. And in fact, it's actually less than the U.S. military spends on research and development. I think that was their conclusion. Also, it's not just uh, uh, advanced technology, advanced killing techniques, and so on. Uh, it's many other things. I mean, is there any other country in the world that has 800 military bases all over the world uh, where the troops are, and uh, supplies and so on are ready for use and are used? It's unique. Also, the U.S., despite the, what we're doing to our own country, I mean, the country is being internally crushed in the most astonishing ways. But despite that, it's still the richest country in the world with enormous advantages. That may not be true for long if current policies continue here, domestic policies. Theoretically, if America did change policy in Israel, uh, how would that affect the broader public opinion in the Arab world? If the United States changed policy? Yeah. Well, one of the real irritants to uh, uh, Arab public opinion is U.S. support for Israel. It's not the only one. I think the National Security Council <clears throat> was basically correct back in the 50s and since that uh, the main issue is that the United States uh, uh, supports harsh, brutal dictatorships, uh, blocks democracy and development, and does so because that's the best way to keep control of their energy supplies. Uh, that's, you know, that's been the major issue. Uh, there are others, like for example, <clears throat> and they're fairly, they're not regular, but there often are uh, public opinion studies. And uh, so, for example, right after the, there was an interesting one right after 9/11. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, to its credit, uh, did a study of public opinion in the Arab world about attitudes toward the United States. Uh, they just kept to the kind of people they were interested in, uh, bankers, uh, professionals, uh, what they called money Muslims, they didn't care about the, what's called the Arab street, you know, just the rich guys, the guys who were all involved in the U.S. Uh, Western international development programs and so on, the neoliberal programs. So they just did a study on them. Well, it turned out to be very much like the uh, uh, conclusions in 1958. Strong opposition to the United States because of its support of harsh dictatorships, its uh, blocking democracy and development, uh, and its efforts to just control the energy uh, system. They had other uh, concerns by then. One concern was, Israel, was support for Israeli occupation and repression. The other concern, which strikingly never really hit the radar in the United States, but it did over the Arab world, uh, was the Iraq sanctions. The uh, sanctions, Clinton sanctions on Iraq, uh, you know, may have killed, uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, maybe a million. Uh, they strengthened the dictatorship, uh, they crushed the population, and they probably pre prevented uh, Saddam Hussein from going the way of other dictators that the U.S. was supporting by internal revolt. And there was enormous bitterness about that over the whole Arab world. You know, these are, these are major crimes. Uh, so there are specific ones, but I think the basic one is, uh, remains the, uh, what, I, what the National Security Council uh, said. Actually, that's responsible for the fact that the United States and Britain, incidentally, also have fairly consistently supported uh, radical Islamism in opposition to secular nationalism. Uh, you can see it right now. The main ally of the United States in the region is Saudi Arabia, which is the most extreme radical Islamic state anywhere also the main supporter of jihadism and funder of jihadism and the uh, ideological center of it. Now that's been uh, the main uh, beneficiary of U.S. and British uh, support for a long time it, because it's the right kind of dictatorship. 
It keeps the population under control. For example, there was an effort in Saudi Arabia to have a, a day of protest, you know, a Friday day of protest, like everywhere else. 